Thank you, Mark, for the introdu introduction. My name is Tony Chen, and I'm a six-year PC student in Mark's lab, Biomimetics and Dextrous Manipulation Lab. And today, I want to talk about designing robotic grippers for interaction with real-world environments. So a little bit of teaser here is robots, while we have robots around for 50, 60, 70 years now, all the way from the beginning in 1966 here at the Shaky, we always have platforms that can start with observation, right? We see what environment we want to deploy the robots in. In this case, it's a hallway, it's a cluttered room. And we're equipping these robots with, with mobility, with a form of mobility in this case. Let's look at, uh, let's have a bunch of sensors on there, see what's, uh, what's ob obstacles in the way. Uh, as, we, as the technology for certain robotic platforms mature, more and more, then we start looking into how do we make these robots more useful? Then it comes to manipulation. So this is a screenshot of uh, the new Boston Dynamics Atlas video that released a couple days ago. Amazing plat like a robot platform can does parkour and a lot of amazing mobility things. But now let's then the next step is let's try to put a grip around there. Let's actually have it to manipulate, uh, have the capability to, to manipulate. So what is manipulation? Manipulation is the way for the capability to give capability to the robot to be able to forcefully interact with its environment, whether that be the real world environment or another object. So today, since I only have 20 minutes, I want to focus on two projects that I worked on here, um, on two other platform, robotic platforms. One is a drone, the other one is a planetary exploration robot. And both of these, in both cases, observation and mobility, they do pretty well, especially for a drone. It's amazing uh, parallel versatility in terms of observing and taking videos and stuff like that. But how do we add the capability to manipulate to these robotic platforms? So first, let's talk about drones. So aerial grasping, this work is uh, done with me and a collaborator Kenneth right here, and it's founded by Air Force. And dr quad rotors drones really have a lot of good versatility as a robotic platform. But right now, it's still very limited in what interaction can have with the real world environment. So this is sort of state of the art, what can drones do? But what can nature do? What has nature been doing for millions of years at this point? Flying creatures like this eagle can catch a fish out of the water like this. So when and how can we equip drones right now with technology that allows us to do something similar to this or work towards it? The challenging thing about aerial grasping is that when you have a drone like this, you want to hit something mid-air. It's going to impart a large angular and linear disturbance to the system. Then how do you develop control strategies that can actually compensate for this and make sure the drone doesn't crash, make sure that it's at the right velocity or position profile to be able to capture the target? All this is to be seen. So where do we start? Designing any gripper, to design any gripper, to design anything to use in robots, we always start with dynamics. So here we actually employ a very, very simple um, quad rotor dynamics, a quad rotor dynamic model. Where you know the, the Fe here and then tau C is the input force and torque due to the collision. And this can sort of be these are related to each other through the drone geometry. And the F, uh, the F subscript U and tell you here is basically the drone controller input, what force and torque is desired. And through a simple feedback policy and as a best case approximation, we can say, okay, they're related to the rotor speed because that's, all in all, that's what you're controlling is the four rotors on the drone. Then through this simplification, then we can say, okay, so this problem turned into the changing linear angular momentum that resulted from this collision. So sure, now we have these equations, how do we make it useful? Because we're using these dynamics to inform our gripper mechanics design. What does that mean? That means that from these two equations, what we can get, we want to reduce the magnitude of this force and reducing the interval as short as possible. More concretely, what does that mean for gripper design? Is that first one motivates a compliance, the use of compliance and friction to dissipate energy during the collision. And the second part motivates a fast acting gripper. So the fast acting gripper also has advantage of aerial grasping that your target is now bouncing out of your grasp. So now we have these lessons we, uh, we're trying to design around. And the three main goals we identify as the main point for this aerial grasper is 
One, we want to minimize the overall weight and inertia because the drone payload is very limited. Two, we want to maximize the allowable maximum velocity difference between the two, target, uh, the two drones. And three, we want to minimize torque applied after the capture so the drone can remain safe after, even after the capturing. So here's a gripper, a cat of the gripper. We designed this gripper, it's all 3D printed. It weighs about 22.7 grams and can close within 12 milliseconds upon impact. We used a compliant suspension mechanism which to reduce the loading during collision and also increase the collision duration compared to a rigid gripper. And I have some videos later showing this. So how does the gripper work? Here's a cutaway of the gripper. You have a force coming in from the collision and there's two parts of the gripper that slide, oops. There's two parts of the gripper that slides on top of each other, the orange part and the white part. It slides backwards, that's your linear, com uh, that's your linear compression, a linear compliance. And this relative movement between the two parts causes a blue tendon to pull the yellow trigger upwards and releases the red block, which has rubber band in there to provide the potential energy. As soon as this trigger is pulled, this red block accelerates forward and pulls this green tendon, which is connected through a bunch of tendon routing to the under actuary finger on the bottom. Then it closes like this. And the blue part here you see is a self-centering ball joint where we build this exploiting the nature of a, the torsional sprint, uh, stiffness of a, of a compression spring. This is very similar to, for those of you who play games, on your Joy-Con, on, on your controllers, how does your, joy, your joystick always self-centers after you apply input? Same principle here. So now, after understanding these things, what we want to move on to is the, what I call the force sufficiency region. We'll talk a little bit more about this. So we have this gripper. It's time to bring into a benchtop testing. How do we validate that it actually works? First, what we did was we mounted this on a six axis force torque sensor ATI right here, and we apply a random force on the top. Empirically, after doing many, many, many trials, we can plot this in force space. Looks like this. So this limit surface in force space basically represents the minimum amount of force it needs from the collision to trigger the grasping sequence because everything is friction in there. And the two examples here is the green vector pierces through this bottom limit surface. So then the, in this case, the uh, grasping sequence would trigger. And the red vector here does not, never intersect with the surface. That means that force is not gonna be able to trigger a, gr a grasping sequence. So now with this sort of force sufficiency region, I want to move over to velocity sufficiency region. Why do we need to do this? Because drones in nature is controlled by velocity, whether you give it position or velocity controlled. It's not too useful when you tell the drone, hey, can you hit the target at two newtons in this direction? Well, the drone doesn't know how to do that. But instead, you tell the drone, okay, can you hit it at this particular velocity within this velocity envelope? Yeah, sure, there's plenty of algorithms out there right now can compute a flight trajectory for you. So that's the importance of velocity sufficiency region. But then how do we go from force to velocity? Another experimental setup. So what we did here is we built an experimental setup, drones mounted on a linear rail powered by a pneumatic piston. So it actually launches the drone off the rail and hits the target drone at the exact moment because it's controlled by electromagnet. We have a force torque sensor mounted on the tip of the drone where the collision happens. You do this many times varying the pressure in the piston, which varies the velocity, gives you this linear relationship between velocity, the exit velocity of the main drone, and what's the peak impulse force we're experiencing at the point of collision. So with this, we can, this can serve as a translator between force and velocity space. At this point, it's time to reevaluate your design. It, does, your, does the gripper at this point actually solve the problem? Does a gripper at this point actually uh, meet the design requirement? If not, we have to go through a redesign process. If it does, time to go through the flight control controller. So before I send any videos, I want to explain a little bit more about this velocity sufficiency region. So I'll redefine it here really quick. Basically, it's a region in velocity space which gives you the highest probability of a grasp success. So I'll break this down a little bit more. Let's look at a 2D slice, easier to do in 2D in um, x and y direction. The lower bound basically is determined by, from the force sufficiency region test. 
is basically if your velocity is in that region, you don't have enough force to trigger the grasping sequence. The size are bounded by the gripper mechanics, how much compliance you have in the angular direction, the yaw and pitch direction of the gripper. And the size and the top are bounded by the quadrotor dynamics. Your, your, uh, your quadrotor is running into another object in mid-flight. The resulting torque and, f uh, torque and force disturbance to the mean drone needs to stay within the control authority. Your drone cannot crash after this intended collision. So this enclosed space right here is the velocity sufficiency region. So basically it's a combination of velocities that we can say, okay, the drone should try to hit the target with these velocity profiles to maximize the chances of success. The key point I want to point out here is that this region is not an absolute, but a gradient. That means as, you approach, as your velocity conditions approach the boundary of this velocity region, the probability of success decreases. So there might be some failure that happens within, even if your velocity is within this region, and there might be some successes in there even if it's outside this region. This is all probability based. You can repeat the same thing to do for the xz direction. Then it gives you this. So I'll explain a little bit more as the video is playing. So we're using a 500 gram drone with the gripper, capturing uh, about 85 gram modified mumble drone um, at various different velocities. Here is about 1.5 meters per second played at 110 speed. And we repeat this many, many times. This is the fastest we have done is 2.7 meters per second. Yeah, the, the propeller didn't make it. <laughs> so this is uh, capturing a relative velocity, basically moving targets. Okay, so this is for area grasping. This is what we did and why we did it. So I want to move on to the second part of this talk. Is let's talk about planetary exploration. So here I have a picture of the Curiosity, and. Well, I want to propose uh, our new robot design is called ReachBot. It's a small robot with exceptional reach for rough terrain. And this is a collaboration between our lab, BDML, and ASL over at, um, uh, over at Aero Astro, and collaborators uh, Stephanie Nudick, who is a student in, the, in ASL, and Carlo, who was an exchange student in our lab, and now he's a PhD student at Berkeley. So what is ReachBot? The concept is a small mobile robot that uses long reach to navigate really difficult terrains and interact with the environment. It has a really, really large workspace, ensures more accessible grasping spots and, uh, and faster tra traverse across certain areas. So what's the problem here? You see a uh, state-of-the-art um, climbing robot. Here's the Lemur 3 here you see on the bottom. Just like you and me also when we go to the climbing wall, I always feel like I could use a longer arm. Once I'm on the wall, can I reach the next hold? It's limited by the length of my arm. But what now, what if your arm is actually extendable, like this? Now that suddenly you have a lot larger workspace you can search. You might not run into dead spots where you thought that you could get to the target, but suddenly in certain parts, midway through the trajectory, you realize you can't reach the next grasping spot. So this is our proposed solution. We use repurposed extendable booms for mobile manipulation to achieve extreme reach. The enabling technology here is these space booms. They collapse really, just imagine them as 3D tape measures. And this is actually a, a thing built by Rocor used to deploy a camera in space uh, outside the space station. They compact really small and then they fold out in a 3D, 3D thing, just exactly like a 3D tape measure. They're really strong in tension, so you can pull on them as hard as you can, just like a tape measure. But with any other force conditions, they're easily buckable. So they, they can go through buckle fairly easily. So these are the extendable booms we're proposing to use as arms. So we have a lot of research pillar, like this is a brand new concept we're trying to propose. There's a lot of things we need to investigate. And my, uh, my colleague Stephanie mainly focuses on trajectory planning and the trajectory optimization of this. But today I want to mo uh, mostly focus on two here, lightweight surface grasping solutions. So if we're talking about grasping solutions, the first thing is what are we trying to grasp? A lot of these lava, under the NASA grant, the, the objective is for us to study the feasibility of a reach bot to explore a subterranean cave on Mars, these lava tube caves on Mars. And 
we're looking to grasp surfaces like this, lava rocks. And the technology we use for grasping these lava rocks is something called microspine. It's bio-inspired. It, uh, it's sort of inspired from, uh, it's inspired from insects such, uh, and co such as cockroaches. Unfortunately, cockroaches are really, really good at climbing vertical walls. And the reason why they, they can do that is that they have these hard spines at their leg. It catches on the small asperities onto seemingly smooth walls to you and me. But it's enough to give them the adhesion they need to climb any, a lot of the surfaces that we think is smooth. With the same principle, we use these need, almost needles on the bottom here, you see that it uses the same principle that catches on these small asperities on rock surfaces to give us adhesion. So this is just a, a quick overview of the technology we're using. We have this entire new concept. Of course, we're not just gonna go out there, we don't have the money either, or the time, or if we, we don't even know if this thing's gonna work to build a whole system. So we need to start somewhere. So what we start is to build a planar prototype, low cost planar prototype. You see here's a planar reach bot that rolls on four bearings that's free floating on a, a flat surface. And like I was hinting earlier, What's the 2D cheap alternative to these expensive space booms? Tape measure. So we motorize these tape measure to extend and retract. And each of these tape measure unit arm is mounted on a servo so that it can uh, rotate, pivot the shoulder joint as well. So it does all the basic functionality of proof of concept for ReachBot. It has this microspan gripper, which I'll go in slightly more detail after this. I want to show the sequence really quick. It extends out, it identifies a grasping spot. It extends out, it uses a passively triggered gripper. So all you have to do is ram it into it. It triggers it, stored energy. And then you can pull on it really quick to give you this adhesion. So now you can move your robot to that location. So this is one of the first uh, tests we did with ReachBot, with planar ReachBot. And now with this capability, you can do a lot more interesting things, such as now you have a free floating robot uh, and the gripper resets. Uh, you can do a lot more interesting things. You have a free floating platform that you can just move around. But now with these grippers, you can actually anchor yourself to the environment. And now you're able to move an object that's way heavier than previously were you able to do. And this is a simple demonstration of that. And now you manipulate to a target location that you want, okay, we can let it go. And we can do, uh, how does robot move? This is a very simple case scenario where you, as long as you maintain tension inside of your arms, you can translate between multiple anchor points like this. So the whole system would look like this. This is a demonstration we put together, is that you are anchored into a certain spot and you are scanning around, you're looking for the next grasping spot. You identify this as a potential grasping spot. You extend your arm out, touches it, it activates a grip, confirms that it's there, it's attached, and then you release and you pull yourself towards the target. So the 2D gripper here, so this whole robot was built as a proof of concept to convince ourselves and other people that this concept works. So for the gripper, we just need something quick and dirty that it works. So we have these microspine grippers on individual suspensions and we have a passively triggered gripper. Here we use a passively triggered gripper because we really need to minimize the amount of weight we put at the end of the boom. Normally it doesn't seem too much weight, but as you increase the weight at the boom and they extend all the way out, maybe four, three, four, five meters, then it becomes a huge weight inertia you are swinging around and you can buckle your boom easily. So we had to really minimize the weight, but we just built something that works. But now the, uh, we're trying to convince ourselves this thing works, then we need to move into 3D. How do we actually build a 3D gripper? So it's with the same train of thought that we, what I talked about before. What we, where do we have to start? We had to start with modeling. So first, we had to understand the spine surface interaction. Their law goes, goes, uh, goes on here. Because the rock surface is stochastic, so everything is probability based. So all these, uh, all these uh, forces are dependent on a lot of things like spine tip radius, surface roughness, material strength, a lot of these things. Once we understand the surface, and this is ongoing research, so 
this is um, once we understand the surface and um, surface uh, spine surface interaction, then we'll say, okay, let's go with the three finger gripper. Now you can write all your kinematics of it, try to come, uh, try to come with force equilibrium and contact conditions, try to write equations of, uh, for the whole entire gripper for dynamic statics and dynamics. And after all this, it can give you basically a wrench that you can apply at the wrist. So that's the thing we're after. It's basically how strong are these grippers attached to the rock and how hard we can pull on things. And you can go through, since everything's probabilistic, you can go through a Monte Carlo simulation and it gives you something like this, a force limit. So it gives you a force, uh, it gives you a limit surface in force space, basically saying given the design, given the parameters of the gripper, how much force can you reasonably uh, get out of the gripper once it's firmly attached to a surface? Once we have the model, we go ahead and build the gripper. And we are uh, still working through multiple iterations and uh, working on all the kinks of it. Once we have a gripper, what do we do next? So we haven't done this yet, but this is the next step. Is, well, we have a model, we have a prototype. It's the same flow logic. Then we had to test it in a lab setting environment. We had to do a bunch of uh, lab tests, pull tests on it, and try to make sure that it can achieve the desired grasping that force that we want. After that, after we validate the model, we either had to go through a redesign process to make sure that we hit the target, the design requirement, or if it's good enough, then let's go test in the field. Uh, test in the field. So right now we're scoping out. This is a lava tube actually at Mojave Desert that we're gonna go later this quarter, try to scope out and build a partial reach bar there so that we can show the whole system working of scanning the area, try to grasp a, uh, on part of the rock, try to pull on it to a certain degree and see to validate our model. So that's where we're here, and I think that's the last slide I have. And I just wanna say thank you real quick for my lab and all the funding sources supporting this project, and I think I'll take questions. I think that's about 21 minutes. I'll take some questions, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, it's very impressive. Um, so you said this robot's purpose was for uh, exploring. Yeah. And I'm wondering, based off of the movement and how fast it can go, like what's the reasonable uh, estimate to how much area you think this robot can explore? It just seems quite slow. Yeah, so that's a good question. So I think, um, I, I think it depends, you know, a lot of things. The current scenario we're looking at is Martian. You know, you look at different, like, um, planetary um, gravity means that how heavy does your robot to be? How long can you extend the boom before it buckles? So it really depends on what gravity regime you were talking about here. A good thing about NASA is that when you talk about these planetary explorations, they don't really care how fast you go. And you compare it to the baseline of what we're comparing right now, a rigid link robot, it should be able to, one, it has two distinct advantages. One is that it can reach a lot more grasping spot at a certain point. Two, to go from one side of the room to the other, if my leg is twice as long, I need to take tw twice as little steps, twice fewer steps from one room to another. So we get that working for us as well. So it's, uh, but if you're talking about another application we're thinking about reach bar is for uh, space, um, space station servicing. But then that, that actually becomes easier because in, that's in microgravity, then you don't really have to worry about part of the gravity, your boom extending out nearly as much the whole thing buckling. So that you have even a longer reach, then you might be able to go from point A to point B just in one step. So it all really depends. Yeah. 